Yes. Yeah. Okay, so you ready for Hans? We are. Hans he will poke you has off. Pro has proven you can turn mild ADD, OCD, and other personality disorders into a successful career. <laughs> <laughs> he shares his life simplification tips at conferences throughout the United States and Canada and on his website. At SunTrust Bank, he established three different centers of excellence and a successful security services delivery team. Hans recently served as a principal consultant at Blueprint Software Systems, helping drive business transformation and delivery excellence. Welcome, Hans. Thank you so much. Woo! All right, thank you everyone for coming. I hope you are going to have a lot of fun. So starting off with just a little bit of mechanics, um, this presentation is shared under the Fair Use Doctrine, so with much love to J.K. Rowling and the different ways her works have been adapted. Um, she maintains full copyright and ownership of the text, and it, I use this with all due respect. Please don't sue me. Um, the images are copyright Warner Brothers from the films, but we are going to be focusing in on the book aspect because it's much more deep. The audio clips are all uh, copyright Jim Dale from the audiobook selection, one of the best narrators ever. His narration was so good, they actually used his narration to drive screening um, of actors for the movies. Um, and then also, anywhere that there isn't a uh, uh, image that's from the movie, there's a copyright attributed to that. So let's start off with a few little ground rules. Um, first, the session's for you. So I want you to interrupt. I want you to ask questions. I want you to let me know. And then we're going to leave time at the end so that we'll be able to open this up to more of a discussion as well. Um, as always, these are some tips and tricks and things that I've identified that work for me. But I highly recommend engaging a coach or a mentor anytime you're doing any significant career changes. In this and all of my presentations, absolutely no harm, animals were harmed. But I do hope you will support your local magical uh, creatures support groups um, in your local communities. So this probably goes without saying, but I've got to start off. Big spoiler alerts. So is there anyone here who has not is has not made it through either all the Harry Potter books or at least through all the movies? Oh my word, you're gonna be you're gonna hate me. Okay. <laughs> I apologize, you'll love the presentation, the content. There's going to be some spoilers. At this point, it's been so many years since they came out, I, don't, I can't claim responsibility, but you've been warned, um, so thank you. So, as we start off, why Harry Potter? Wonderful book, amazing story, really turned so many uh, kids and even adults onto literature who might not normally have experienced it. But who was he? Why does this matter to us in a, you know, muggle world? Was Harry the greatest wizard of all time? Yes. No. He's awesome. All right, no. Who's the greatest wizard of all time? Dumbledore. Dumbledore, okay. Was he a dark wizard with tremendous powers? No. So that was one of the theories, is that that's maybe how he survived the attack by he who must not be named. Was he the cleverest wizard of his year? No. Okay, well, who was that? Hermione. Okay, so wait a minute. We're striking out here. Why are we talking about Harry? Was he a boy who survived by luck alone and the sacrifices of others as he was accused? Yes. Yes, no, maybe. No. Now think, what I want you to do is think about this. Harry was special, not because of who he was. He wasn't ordained. This isn't Greek mythology where, you know, Zeus was his father and he had special abilities. He or Neville could have been the chosen one. It could have been Neville in the Chamber of Secrets at any point. So we want to look for the Harry that's in each of us. What is it that we can do to make our lives extraordinary, to have extraordinary impact, to be that way? So it's not so much him. So we're going to start off, and excuse me, if anyone didn't get it, um, I do have copies of these seven lessons up front. You can get them at the end. So the first thing we're going to look at is you're going to grow through failure. Next thing is you need to either find the right teacher or be the right teacher. This is one that I've been saying for years and just love. You've got to play to your strengths. If there's one thing you take away from this, I want you to play to your strengths. You must be able to adapt to change. It's the choices you make that define you. Perseverance is needed to overcome adversity. 
And individuals may be able to complete tasks, but it's the teams that win battles. So these are the seven areas we're going to cover. So let's start off with growing through failure. So how many people here think that Dumbledore might have been one of the least responsible adults of all time? <laughs> think about what, how he ran the school. He was hiring werewolves and half giants and insane aurors who jumped at everything. In Sorcerer's Stone, he let Harry tackle um, Quirrell to save the Sorcerer's Stone with very limited direct help. In the Chamber of Secrets, he knew the chamber had been opened. He knew who opened the chamber. He might have even had a good idea what was in the chamber. The dude was pretty smart. And, let he, and yet he let Harry tackle this? I mean, dude, talk about a lawsuit in today's society. <laughs> Dumbledore would have been messed up. In the Triwizard Tournament, yes, Harry was magically bound to compete. All he would have had to do was step forward and step back and get zero points for each event. And he would have been safe. But Dumbledore let him participate, encouraged him to participate. And probably the biggest one that becomes a driving force in the later books is the search for Horcruxes and how little guidance, little support, and how dangerous that was going to be. So why is this? Like, why is Dumbledore putting Harry through all of these tests, all of these trials? <clears throat> well, the first thing, and it comes out from the very beginning of the first story, Dumbledore knew Voldemort was coming back. He didn't know when, he didn't know how, but he knew he would be back, and he knew Harry was going to have to face him. So he had a limited amount of time to give Harry all the training, support, and growth he could to be ready when that happened. If you think about it, Harry goes from muggle to facing Voldemort in six years. That's how much time and training. Think how far you've gone in six years. And even Harry says several times in the books, especially at the beginning, he often felt that Dumbledore would knew what was going on and letting him stretch his wings. He knew who was sneaking into the forest. He knew, even gave Harry the invisibility cloak. So he did this because he needed Harry to understand, he needed to develop, he needed to be able to test his wings. So how are we going to apply this? And you're going to see the same pattern. I'm going to talk a little bit about the background in the book, why it's important, and then how do we apply this? Because that's what really matters here. None of us, well, some of you may have your le uh, Hogwarts letters. I haven't gotten mine yet. First thing is, you've got to volunteer for new challenges. It's only through volunteering, it's only stepping out of your comfort zone that the greatest opportunities are going to present themselves. That's when you're going to grow. Um, in my career, the worst projects, the worst managers, the worst situations I've been in have been the greatest teachers to me and I've been able to survive. Also, don't be afraid to fail. And I think this is where I, I take serious issue with the notion in Agile and in other presentations that say, fail fast, fail safe. Why is it failure? If you are setting acceptance criteria for going forward, you're not failing. You're determining what is needed. What do we have to learn? What are the decisions we have to make to go forward? Those aren't failures. The only failure you can have at work or in your personal life is doing nothing. If you do not try, you will fail. Other than that, you are always learning. You are always developing. And we also have to remember, we've got to delegate to our team, even if we can do the job better. And this was a lesson that was taught to me when I was in college. But it took years and years and years for me to understand that the best leaders are master delegators. And so I want you to look for opportunities to turn works over to, ju to more junior people. Expose other people, other roles to the work you're doing. Give them a chance to stretch their wings because one day you're going to need their help and you're not going to be able to do it for them. <clears throat> so in the next one, Hermione and Ron have determined that their defense against the dark arts is so horrible that they want Harry to become their teacher because he's been there, he's lived that. So here's a clip as Hermione is trying to convince Harry that he should be and is qualified to be their teacher. You did listen to what I said about a load of it being luck, didn't you? Yes, Harry, said Hermione gently, but all this thing. There's no point pretending that you're not good at defense against the dark arts because you are. You were the only person last year who could throw off the imperious curse completely. You could produce a Patronus, 
You can do all sorts of stuff that full grown wizards can't do. So when we think about that, Dolores Umbridge brings the worst curriculum ever. Nothing practical, horrible. She is so hated. She is even hated more by Harry Potter fans than the darkest wizard of all times. That's how much we relate to people like her in our lives and how awful that is. So look at Lupin when he came in as the Defense Against the Dark Arts teacher. <clears throat> the first thing he did was he started teaching them practical, hands-on defense. The first thing they tackled was the Bogart and the Cabinet. And he made them face it with very little practice, without reading their spell books. And to tackle and to learn. And think about one of the best final exams ever, an uh, uh, obstacle course of magical creatures. Like how fun would that be? So as we're going forward, it's important to figure out that it's not just about the information. It's how do you learn and how do you apply that? When we go to the Babak, we don't go to it as a reference manual. It only makes sense if we know how to apply that to our jobs, to our lives. If not, it's just as bad as Dolores Umbridge. Don't tell the IIBA I said that. <laughs> I want you to look and find a variety of coaches and mentors. Everyone in here has a unique perspective that you could teach me, that you could teach someone else. And unless you talk to people, unless you share your hero stories, we're not going to learn from your successes. So share your hero stories, share your uh, efforts. Ask other people when you encounter problems and see if they have a way of solving it. And when you're teaching, and this is really hard for a lot of us, you can't just click and show somebody how to do it and expect them to learn. They need to have the hands on the keyboard. They need to experience it. Which means if you're doing a walkthrough with your stakeholders, you don't want to click through and show them then they're going to do this, then they're going to do this, then they're going to do this. Your stakeholders should be driving that. They should be the ones. They've got to learn. They've got to experience it. So when you think about how Harry was teaching the DA, he starts off by saying something very simple. I don't know what spells are going to protect you, but here's a, real, a few really simple ones that helped me. These are the ones that saved me when I was in a crisis. I didn't think, I didn't have a class, I didn't get a do-over, I just did whatever I thought was best. So think about that, and I want you to really try and see if you can help people experience and grow with them doing it, not you doing it for them. So in our next one, one of my greatest things that I always tell people is, you've got to play to your strengths. So in this case, we meet Alistair Moody during the Tri-Wizard Tournament. And he's trying to coach Harry after the, Harry's discovered that the first task is surviving dragons. And he doesn't want to overtly cheat, so he's trying to lead Harry down the path to discover how does, what is Harry's strengths, how does he play to him. Play to your strengths. I haven't got any, said Harry, before he could stop himself. Excuse me, growled Moody. You've got strengths if I say you've got them. Think now. What are you best at? Harry tried to concentrate. What was he best at? Well, that was easy, really. Quidditch, he said dully. And a fat lot of help. That's right, said Moody, staring at him very hard, his magical eye barely moving at all. You're a damn good flyer, from what I've heard. Yeah, but, Harry stared at him. I'm not allowed a broom. I've only got my wand. And that was the start for Harry learning to survive the Triwizard Tournament. He was younger than anyone else, <clears throat> less experienced, less qualified as a wizard, not even a qualified adult. So he didn't have the maturity, the skills, the ability that anyone else does. Just like we do if we compare ourselves to more senior people or people that have been in the business and know the domain in and out. He had to figure a way of completing each of the tasks that played to his strengths that worked within his abilities, with opportunities that he could actually do. It wouldn't do any do good to do a complex spell. He didn't have the experience. He wouldn't be able to pull it off. I mean, look at how much trouble he had with the summoning spell, and that was a pretty simple one. So how do we apply this? First thing I want you to do is ask yourself, and I want you to keep asking yourself this every day, every week, every year, whatever your sequence is. What are three things you do uncommonly well 
that an average person in your position doesn't. I want you to help, I want you to figure out what are the three things that you do that nobody else can do. And if you catch me later, I've got a story to go along with that, but um, it'll have to, to wait. When you identify the things you do exceptionally well, I want you to find a way of shifting your tasks to use those skills. I want you to find a way of using your strengths, not just trying to do the way other people do or the way you're told. And if you find yourself avoiding tasks, avoiding work, not doing something, it's probably because it's something that doesn't play to your strengths. I am one of, the, one of the world's worst accountants. I suck at financial management. I'm great with data analysis and data numbers, and I can do modeling, but budgets and, oh man, I'm horrible. And anytime I'm responsible for that, I avoid it. And you've got to catch yourself. If you're avoiding certain types of work, you've got to find a way of twisting that in one of two things. Either twist it in a way that will use your strengths so you will do it, change the name, change the way you're looking at it, or delegate it to someone else. When I was running a delivery work stream for the bank, I wasn't good at the project accounting. So I found somebody on the team, one of my senior project managers, and put him in charge of making sure that all our project accounting was right, and coaching and working with other people. And it was a great growth opportunity for him, and it took something away from me that I truly hated. So look for those opportunities to dump the work you hate. In the next one, and this pops up several times throughout Harry Potter as well, you have to be able to adapt to change. So in this situation, Snape has finally gotten one of his two lifelong dreams. He is now the defense against the dark arts teacher. And he leads the lesson talking about change and why change is so important to defense against the dark arts. The dark arts, said Snape, are many, varied, ever-changing, and eternal. Fighting them is like fighting a many-headed monster, which each time a neck is severed, sprouts a head even fiercer and cleverer than before. You are fighting that which is unfixed, mutating, indestructible. So when Harry starts the DA, he starts with simple spells. What's Harry's first spell when he starts the DA? What's the first thing they work on? Expelliarmus. Why? Like, why not a stunning spell or a shield spell? For him, it was a spell that he was good at, and it always seemed to pop in mind when he needed it. And they even, some of the characters even make fun of him, saying, this is basic, this is simple. But sometimes it is the simple things, because it's not so much doing the best thing, it's doing something at the time you need to. Doing anything now is almost always better than doing the perfect thing later. And so he knew that they weren't going to know what the challenges they're going to face. It wasn't something they could practice for. So they had to build their toolbox with different spells, with different skills, to play to their strengths so when it mattered, they would be able to defend themselves, to win the battles that they were going to face. Like if you think about it, who was, who was known and renowned so much for their bat bogey hex that it got them into the slug club? Who was it? Jenny. Jenny Weasley, yeah. That, she just had a knack for that one thing. Now is that better than a stunning spell or a pedimenta? Who knows? But for her, it's one she could go to that had a desired effect. So always, again, think about it. Everything we're dealing with has changed. So the more skills, the more tools, the more abilities, the more scenarios you put yourself through, the better you're able to respond. And at the end, taking action now is almost always going to be better than trying to find the perfect answer. And that's, you know, it's one of the tenements of, ad, of Agile. Ship the product. Yes, it could always be better. But when is done, done? When are you going to ship? If you're doing waterfall, you can do the same thing. Set up iterations. When are we going to say this is good enough to move forward? Because it's never going to be perfect. And if you want perfect, you know, you're going to run the business out of business before that happens. So how do we, um, 
So how do we apply this? First, I don't want you to focus as much time on tasks. See if you can shift the way you work to focus more on outcomes. And do we have any like really true PMs in the crowd? All right, you're gonna hate me on this one. <laughs> PMs are notorious about trying to line up specific tasks with dependencies <laughs> in order to a schedule and saying this is how it has to be done. We can learn from their mistake and instead, what if they are tagging outcomes instead of activities? During this time period, we will complete this outcome, and it's the outcome we will hold to, to schedule. There may be some activities that say these things have to get done for this outcome to happen, that's fine, but we need to focus on what it is we're trying to achieve. Again, build your network, build your support teams, build your mentors, build your coaches, build your templates, your tools to adapt to change. And one of my favorite quotes, and I think Charles Darwin said it better than, than anyone could have, it's not the strongest of the species that survive nor the most intelligent. It's the ones that are most responsive to change. You don't have to be the smartest person in your company, or in work, or in your role. You don't have to be the strongest. But if you're the one who can adapt to change better than anyone else, you are going to outperform all of your peers. So start thinking and start shifting your focus less on, to more outcomes, and focus on how do I get ready because something's going to go wrong, how am I going to deal with that? So the next one I want to introduce comes as Harry has emerged from the Chamber of Secrets and he's having a serious, almost moral breakdown. Is he really like Tom Riddle? Is he evil? Is, should he be been in Slytherin? Or is there something else going on here? So he gets into the conversation with Dumbledore. So here's an excerpt of the conversation between Dumbledore and Harry in his office after he's come out of the Chamber of Secrets. It only put me in Gryffindor, said Harry in a defeated voice, because I asked not to go in Slytherin. Exactly, said Dumbledore, beaming once more, which makes you very different from Tom Riddle. It is our choices, Harry, that show what we truly are, far more than our abilities. So at the very beginning, one of the first choices Harry ends up making in his new wizarding world is the decision that he doesn't want to be in Slytherin. From meeting Draco Malfoy to everything he's heard, that is his first moral choice that is his first destination postcard, saying who he wants to be as an adult wizard, and the type of person he wants to be. And the hat respected that choice, and it's a choice that pops up repeatedly for Harry, that at many critical moments, he had to make a decision, what to follow, what to do. And those choices is what defines him and turns him into the hero of the story. Harry even chooses Ron as a friend over Malfoy. Malfoy has more money, more influence, more prestige. But something inside him tells Ron is the type of person. He saw the potential in Ron, maybe even before Ron saw it, since he was one of the youngest brothers and had to compete. Think about the progression of Neville, one of the greatest character developments in Harry Potter, and the fact that he was in Gryffindor from the very beginning. The Hat and Dumbledore and everyone knew what he could become if he made the right choices along the way. And ultimately for Harry, probably the toughest choice that a character would have to make is when he decided, now knowing all the facts, that he was going to walk into the Forbidden Forest, that he was going to fulfill his destiny and what the cost to him would be. And he did it willingly, and he didn't let anything come in. Think about the difficulty of how hard that choice must have been for him and how critical it was to the outcome. So how do we apply this? We're not going to have great moments where we dive into the pensive and get a look into all the things we missed in the story along the way. But I want you to try and look for the moments in your life where you can make a choice, you can make a decision, you can do 
as Dumbledore says, there's a time when we must choose between what is easy and what is right. 80, 90% of our days are pretty boring. Almost anyone can do it. But that 10 to 20%, when you step out of your boundaries, when you take a chance, when you lead, when you take a risk, is what makes all the difference in the world. So I want you to try and recognize more of those moments. Is it standing up to a stakeholder? Is it confronting somebody who's being disruptive in meetings? Is it proposing that you need to crush a $4.5 million project because it's going to be a waste of money? All of those take courage. They all have risk. They're all going to be the foundation that builds you into the strongest, the best version of you. So next, I want to talk a little bit about how perseverance is one of the keys to overcoming adversity. So Dumbledore, uh, after Harry recovers the lost memory in The Half-Blood Prince, he and Dumbledore are now having the first conversation when Horcruxes come up and starting to talk about what their real challenge is going to be. So here's that conversation between Dumbledore and Harry. He made seven Horcruxes, said Harry, horror struck, while several of the portraits on the wall made similar noises of shock and outrage. But they could be anywhere in the world, hidden, buried, or invisible. I am glad to see you appreciate the magnitude of the problem, said Dumbledore calmly. So think about the perseverance that the characters had to go through here. Harry finding out that he's now got to search for the Horcruxes that could be anywhere, could be anything, are going to be highly protected. Like for a junior wizard, that's an amazing challenge. And he also has to overcome his feeling of betrayal and the thought that Dumbledore surrounded his life with secrets and lies and brought his whole concept of who Dumbledore was, what this quest was, what his role was into question. When Ron leaves them in book seven, but decides to come back, the courage it would take to make that decision, that he had gone as long as he could, and then to make the final commitment that says, whatever happens, I'm in it till the end. And even earlier, Hermione, before this even started, hid her parents so that they would be safe. If you think about it, she made one of the most definite choices. There was no going back. Like for her, it was permanent. It was either success or failure. She was in 100% and knew and understood and accepted it, maybe even before Harry and Ron had. So a lot of the book, Harry throughout, what's setting him apart is he's facing adversity. He's facing challenges. But he's continuing to move forward. So how do we apply this? First, it's really hard to just keep going when you have no success. So try and look for some quick wins. Look for successes. Look for ways that your team can get a victory, positive feedback, something to drive them on. So who here knows um, if you're in credit card debt, how many people are familiar with the uh, approach that used to be sponsored by the Consumer Credit Bureau that says rank them from highest interest rate to lowest interest rate and pay them off in that order. Why was that? Why would we go highest interest rate to lowest? Heaven. You're going to be paying less interest once you get the highest interest rate to pay off. Okay. You have more money to contribute to your debt. Absolutely. So, rule Not number one if you. Experience of course. <laughs> rule number one if you find yourself in a hole, stop digging. So, the theory was. Every, if the highest interest rate was adding more debt, making your journey harder, so pay that off. Well, you know what they found would be twice as productive and you were twice as likely Snowball. to get out of debt? Snowball. Pay the short, smallest balances first. First, that doesn't make sense. But if you rank your debt smallest balance to highest, the first small balance is attainable. You can make some small changes in your life and pay off that balance. And now you've got a victory. You can close that account. Then you go to the next biggest one, and it's a little bit harder. But you had success before, so you know you can do it, so it's a little bit more of a stretch. And then the next one's a little bit more of a stretch. And then the next one's a little bit more of a stretch. 
by the time you get to the end, by the time you get to your largest debt, you've had so many successes, you know you can do it. You have already made the smaller changes to your life to free up the money to pay off the debt. Why don't we do that in the rest of our lives? If you think about the classic waterfall project, are we really going to put in all of our work and then see if we hopefully got lucky at the end and the darn thing works? And how many times does that fall back on us? But can we find smaller things to test along the way? Can we find smaller team wins? If you are joining a new team, if you are joining something that is really difficult, find something that you all can do together and celebrate. And celebrate that victory. And make sure people know that this is just one step. And when they get disheartened later, then you can go back and say, but remember when we thought we couldn't do this and we did? Remember when we didn't think we could do this and we did? Those are the moments that will build team morale and help keep you going. The older I get, especially the more I work in stagnant or highly regulated companies, the more I'm realizing that perseverance is probably one of the greatest assets you can have. Because if you think things are going to change fast, or people are going to listen, you're going to get burned out really fast. But if you know it's a very long journey, I have a presentation on forming the first center of excellence I help. It took three years of constant setbacks and rejection before we finally, in the eyes of the organization, succeeded and were acknowledged. But we never stopped. We knew it was the right thing to do. We just kept trying different things until it stuck. And in order to, do, to help you with the perseverance, this is the perfect time to build the depth and breadth of your toolbox. The more techniques, the more skills, the more knowledge, the wider your network, the more support you have, the easier this is. You're going to face challenges that you've never faced before. Why not have a network of people that can help you? Why not have mentors and coaches in place? One of mine, luckily, is um, Dusty Rhodes. He is long retired, but he's one of the most brilliant marketing people, one of the most brilliant managers, one of the most ADD people I've ever worked with. And anytime I have something interesting, if I go to him, he's got a story. It might not be the right story, but it helps me get down the path. So we get together at least once a month, meet at the Chick-fil-A, and we swap stories and we stop problems to try and help each other work through these challenges. So I want you to focus on what do you want in your toolbox. If you're talking about the T-shape, which has come up a couple times today, are you going for breadth? Are you going for depth? And when are you going back and forth? There's a time and a place for all of it. We can't have unlimited breadth and unlimited depth. So you've got to decide what's right for you and where you want to take your career. So our next one, individuals complete tasks, but it's the teams that win battles. So in the very beginning, Harry, Ron, and Hermione are debating <clears throat> how safe is the Sorcerer's Stone. Like, they are already worried that it might not be as safe as Dumbledore thinks it is, and that, some, and that uh, Snape is trying to get it. So here's Harry's talking a little bit about what he thinks is protecting it. I reckon there are other things guarding the stone, apart from nothing. Little to many charms, probably, and Quirrell would have done some anti-dark heart spell that Snape needs to break through. So already, they're recognizing that this isn't a one and done. This isn't just fluffy. There's got to be a series of challenges, a series of things that are protecting it. And with that knowledge, they then decide that they're going to go forward and try and get through all of those barriers assuming that Snape can get through the barriers as well. And what really mattered was, if you think about that first battle, it sets up the trio for really the rest of the books. Harry could have never saved the stone if all three weren't present. How did Ron help? Chess. One of the best games of Wizards Chess ever played at Hogwarts. He helped. Ron and Hermione were not very good at chess. They probably would have lost. Even Ron came close to losing and had to sacrifice to make sure that they won. What about Hermione? How did she contribute? De Devil Snare. Yep. She was the one who helped them out of Devil Snare, and then again she came back and helped them against the potions. The logic test. 
because most wizards aren't good at logic or don't put any value in it. So Hermione and Ron directly contributed to Harry being the one to get through. But at the end, even Hermione acknowledged there was a point where she needed to turn back and it was something that Harry needed to face. Now, was she right or wrong? Who knows? Um, I, I don't know that she was necessarily right in that decision, but at that point, it sets up the conflict that Harry is taking on, which is, in the end, it is a battle between him and the Dark Lord. When we look at the Order of, and the, Order of the Phoenix, uh, excuse me, um, the Department of Mysteries and the book Order of the Phoenix, Dumbledore and the Order of the Phoenix and Harry and his core members of the DA are the ones who go to the, uh, to the Department of Mysteries to save Sirius. It is together, fighting together and working together that they survive. What would have happened if Harry had gone alone? Probably not, would have, wouldn't have had much of a chance. Everybody contributed to that battle, to keeping the Death Eaters at bay. Well, what happens when they get into the room with the veil? Could have they survived if the Order had not shown up to help them? They were in a checkmate, like Harry even was turning over the prophecy. There was nothing he could do. They were outnumbered. So it was the combination of the two teams that were able to defeat the Death Eaters. So there are a time and a place where we have individual battles that we're the only ones that can face it. But more times than not, we can face those as a team, and it will make us stronger and give us a better chance of winning. So, how do we do this? The strength of your team is the strength of your network. And networking, you know, people say, it's a contact sport. You need to do it all the time. <laughs> it is. I hate that. But it's true. You should all set aside a certain amount of time each week, whatever you're doing, to reach out and connect with at least one person. Just start with one person. Hey, what's up? How are you doing? Hey, I saw on LinkedIn that you took on a new role. What's it like? A lot of times they might not respond, but keep reaching out. Keep seeing. Um, the last opportunity I had, I randomly checked in with somebody that I had met through the conferences. You know, just somebody like any one of you, we had met, we had talked. This person had sat in on a couple of my sessions. I think I sat in on one of his. And he's like, hey, what are you doing right now? We have a client who bought our tool, has been using it for three years, and hasn't been able to get it live. We need somebody to, to jumpstart this and help, you know, everything you were talking about in that presentation, we want you to come and help them build and set that up. Are you busy? Can we steal you? I'm like, all right, that sounds like fun, and ended up turning into a pretty cool engagement with them. So it was just that random thing, but you've got to reach out, you've got to see what's going on, and build that support network, build that trust. Because if you just go to people at the moment you need help, if they volunteered as a coach or a mentor, they'll probably help you. If not, they know you need something and they've got to weigh that against their other responsibilities. So think about that and really build that networking. It's hard, especially for us introverts. Find a way to do it within your comfort zone. LinkedIn messaging or email is a good way of being personal without actually having to talk to anybody. So just figure out what works for you. As you're working as a team, find the people that are best suited to the tasks. Find the Rons and the Hermiones that can help you through those difficult parts. Engage them. Stroke their ego if you need to. Um, I work with a phenomenal uh, infrastructure architect who was the one of the most difficult people to work with. He was condescending, he was rude, he didn't want to participate. But if I spent time before the meeting, before I needed his help, and told him why his contributions were important, and how he could help be the hero of getting us through this period, he was one of the most collaborative, positive, helpful people. He would still grumble a lot, but the stuff got done and he worked miracles for us. He even found ways of doing things we didn't know, like how to steal servers that were being queued up for another project while we bought our servers so that ours could get plugged in before theirs because he knew they didn't need them for an extra two weeks and he could be a week late with them and have ours immediately. So, <laughs> great little tricks, but I would have never known if I hadn't sat down and talked to him over lunch one day. 
Um, and then also, very important, look for opportunities where you can build out your skills or your team can build out your skills. Think about when we went back to the first part. Harry had to try his wings. You've got to look for those opportunities to stretch. If you are good at use cases but haven't written user stories, maybe you start trying to write a few user stories and see how that works. Maybe you try a few of the advanced features in Visio. Maybe if you're an introvert, you try calling somebody instead of emailing them. That's a big step to build your social scripts to be able to get through those difficulties. If you're an extrovert, maybe you leave some of us introverts alone for a little bit. Try <laughs> it helps. So try and find ways to develop your skills in new areas. Um, and before we, before we delve into uh, more of a, a discussion of, of the lessons and, and how to apply these, um, I had difficulty as I was trying to figure out how to put this in. And at the end, I just thought, you know, this passage, this area, although a little longer, ends up summing up, I think, what I hope to accomplish with the presentation, what I thought was valuable and wanted to share with you. And at the end, it's the choices we make. Our choices make all the difference in the world. And Dumbledore on multiple occasions says this. So I want to share the conversation between Harry and Dumbledore, where Harry finally understands why we are the heroes of our own journey. We are the captains of our own pirate ship, as Jen Batten might tell you. We are the black belt of our karate class, as we heard earlier. So I want to share this to hopefully pull it all together. Sir, said Harry, making valiant efforts not to sound argumentative. It all comes to the same thing, doesn't it? I've got to try and kill you, or got to, said Dumbledore. Of course you've got to, but not because of the prophecy. Because you yourself will never rest until you've tried. We both know it. Imagine, please, just for a moment, that you had never heard that prophecy. How would you feel about Voldemort now? Think. Harry watched Dumbledore striding up and down in front of him and thought. He thought of his mother, his father, and Sirius. He thought of Cedric Diggory. He thought of all the terrible deeds he knew Lord Voldemort had done. A flame seemed to leap inside his chest, searing his throat. I want him finished, said Harry quietly, and I want to do it. Of course you would, cried Dumbledore. You see, the prophecy does not mean you have to do anything. But the prophecy caused Lord Voldemort to mark you as his equal. In other words, you are free to choose your way, quite free to turn your back on the prophecy. But Voldemort continues to set store by the prophecy. He will continue to hunt you, which makes it certain, really, that... That one of us is going to end up killing the other, said Harry. Yes. But he understood at last what Dumbledore had been trying to tell him. It was, he thought, the difference between being dragged into the arena to face a battle to the death and walking into the arena with your head held high. Some people perhaps would say that there was little to choose between the two ways, but Dumbledore knew, and so do I, thought Harry, with a rush of fierce pride, and so did my parents, that there was all the difference in the world. So when Harry emerges, after the battle at the Department of Mysteries. Dumbledore, for the first time, tells him about the prophecy and what his role is, and why it was his life that's been disrupted, why he lost his parents and not Neville. And he struggles here, because he does, he's thinking that he's forced into this. Like, we're forced into the roles. Somehow we got sidetracked into a life of being a BA and we can't escape. <laughs> and now we're doomed to ask why for the rest of our lives and be overlooked for promotions and struggle and be unappreciated. And Harry finally realizes that if you look at it from the opposite perspective, it's not that we're being carried along by the choices we made, but that who we are has defined the choices we make, has told us who we are and who we want to be and how we want to help and how we want to make things better or worse, if you choose. And it's those choices 
that make the difference. You can decide, leaving today, do you take the information you learned and just get a little bit better, maybe get promoted, maybe get a raise, maybe get a better job, maybe get to actually see a window with sunshine and not just a cue wall. Whatever your goal is, that's fine. But what if you seize that opportunity and realize that the who you are, what you want to accomplish, why you do your job is important enough to stand up and make the difficult choice and not be dragged into our meeting arena where you're going to be slaughtered. But instead, you're going to walk in boldly. You're going to face the difficult stakeholders. You're going to face the antisocial developers. And you're going to get things done because they need to get done. You're going to be the advocate for the person who's at the final end, who's the end consumer. There may be bigger things in life. That's kind of up to you to decide. So as we look at the seven lessons, these are things that I want you to consider and figure out how can you apply them, how can you use them, and one of the hardest things is sometimes taking what we know, like I know this technique, I understand and can repeat it, I just don't know when to use it. And that can be the challenge. So for me, one of the things that's been really helpful is to try and find uh, something that's analogous. So for me, if I'm struggling in something in my life and I don't know what it is, but I keep wanting to listen to Harry Potter or five dysfunc seven dysfunctions of a team. Five, seven. Five. <sighs> Sorry, long day. Five. Roll to do five. Seven Harry Potters, five dysfunctions. Five dysfunctions of a team. My brain is telling me I'm missing something. And there's a lesson, there's an approach, there's a viewpoint, there's a perspective that I'm missing that I need to have. So I go back to that. If there's somebody that I want to reach out to and talk to, it's because they are probably going to fill in that gap. And you never know when it's going to pop up. I had a chance a couple weeks ago bumping into a colleague, and we just were catching up a little bit. And suddenly I found myself telling him about a very difficult challenge I was going through. And I even started it by saying, I'm not looking for a solution, because I don't know that there is one yet. I can tell you about the problems, I can tell you about how I'm addressing it, but I think there's a reason I want to talk to you about it. I think you're going to help me get over it. I know I've got a mental block, I've got a jam. And sure enough, he did. He helped me clear the way. Not all the way, it's still pretty foggy, but he helped me over a hurdle <coughs> that let me at least get to the next step and see what the next roadblock might be. So what I want to do is take um, some of the rest of our time and I'd like any of you to share any of these topics, any of, anything that you think you can apply, anything that you'll use, anything that resonated with you. I'd like some people to share what connected. Yes? Um, I think when you talk about growing through failure, um, for me it's kind of like a pride thing to admit that I failed, so I'm not competitive or whatever, but um, some of the greatest accomplishments that I've had on projects have come from failing early on or failing at a project in general and it just made me realize like what can be better later. So for her, it's accepting failure and recognizing failure and trying things and admitting that it didn't work. And some of the, the some of the best failures came early on when you learn from. And I want to challenge you, if you can. See if you can substitute the word failure. Maybe you didn't get the intended outcome. But if something didn't go the way you thought it went, but turned out the way it should have gone, or the way it needed to go, is that a failure? Is doing something that stops a bad thing from happening a failure? It's kind of like saying, well, my anti-lock brakes prevented me from running into the back of the truck, so my airbag and seatbelt failed to deploy. <laughs> Dude, you didn't have an accident. Like, not deploying was the best thing ever. Think about that, though. It's our anti-lock brakes that we need to focus in on, not the fact that the airbag didn't deploy. We don't want the airbag to deploy. So if you're trying, if you're learning, if you're discovering what may or may not work, then it's not a failure. And if you look back, and this is real, I'll say this is really hard, but it, it's helped me a lot. If you look back at the situations in life and say, if I knew what I knew then, would I make the same choice? 
The answer is always yes, if you're being truthful. Because how many times do we, look, when we're about to make a decision, willingly choose to make the dumb choice? We don't. We make the best choice every time we can. Now, in retrospect, when I've got more information, when I've got more help, a new perspective, I now know it's not going to work. When I go back and make a different decision, yes. But I have more information. It doesn't count. Like, there's no way you can go back with the same information in the same situation and make a different choice unless you literally flipped a coin. In which case, I probably don't want you on the project team because coin flipping should not be part of project decisions. <laughs> unless it's part of a game or an exercise. So, thank you. Would you like Lichpin or Moon is a Harsh Mistress? Sci-fi book, one of the most influential. Um, how to be a linchpin and indispensable in your organization. Good choice. Who else wants to share? Yes. So adapting to change. We expect change to happen immediately, but some change takes time, and it takes other things to move into motion. And to, like you said, to be ready so that when that change kicks in, to be able to accept it and use that as a launching point. Absolutely. So um, does anyone remember, and I, I apologize, the study that said how many times you have to repeat or how long it takes for something to become permanent to change a behavior? 21 days, completely and totally false and disproved by all modern research. A minimum of nine months to change a behavior. So, all of us who thought we failed on day 22, no, you quit before you got to nine months. Can you pass this back to her? Thank you. Um, so, go ahead, Heather. I've just been having conversations on Twitter, actually, about the PBAs, about the work. I'm going to do this yeah. during questions so that everyone can hear, and I won't. That's bad. Okay. Okay. I've been having a conversation through Twitter with a couple of other gay friends about this work failure. And when I got to I was like, oh, this is a really interesting new guy that I'm slide. If you were to replace that and say you will grow through experimentation, does that change the way you feel about that? Grow through experimentation. That was like the synopsis of the conversation. Yeah, so growing through experimentation versus failure. Yeah, so as you've all seen, and of course leave it to the BAs to pick out the, uh, the mistake in my requirements of using the word failure and telling everyone not to use failure. Um, so yeah, growing through experience, growing through experimentation, growing through trials, absolutely. Um, and testing yourself. So yeah, that one's probably significant enough I should change. Take it or leave it. No, I, no I mean, it is good. And now I don't even remember why I said failure. Going back to our comment about pride, do we feel prideful when we experiment and the experiment isn't successful? It's a question you have to ask yourself. Do you feel differently about it? Can your company culture adopt a culture of experimentation versus a culture of failure? I think there's some some word language there that can change perceptions. Absolutely. So if, if your organization is, is continuing to define everything in terms of failure, then you're thinking of everything that doesn't match expectations as a failure. Well, what about in Agile when you're testing out a hypothesis? You're testing a hypothesis. You're not looking to fail it. So instead, if you can focus projects, focus decisions on not how will we know whether there's why? What if instead we said, here are the success criteria for each point in time to decide how we move forward? Or we're going to rank things as we're going through, and here are seven different categories, and we are going to score them one to three based on how we evaluate, and nothing will go to the next epic or to the next sprint unless it gets a certain number of points. So we now have success points instead of just velocity. And you have to get, you can create a ranking system. It also takes a lot of the uh, objections out of the way. So instead you're now talking about 
what it takes to know that you're succeeding, and it's that's what Agile is supposed to be about. And very few people are doing it that way, but absolutely, I love that. Um, other things people would like to share, questions, comments, other lessons you learned from the Harry Potter series that I may have omitted. Do I change who I'm giving to, who I'm investing in, what I'm investing for myself? 
What if it's even lower? What if it's even lower? What is the amount that if I had, I could live off the interest? And what would my quality of life be? What would be if it was a little bit lower? And what I found is, it has helped me so much because it tells me what I can't see that's in front of my eyes. What's important to me and what's important to my life? Because if I keep cutting it down, suddenly I'm like, okay, if I'm still doing these things over here, they must be important. Why are they important? And if they're that important that if I had money to throw away, I would invest in these areas, can I have a piece of that now? Are there ways I can get some of that, work with some of that, work in that area, accomplish those same goals without necessarily having to do it by the lottery fantasy, which I'm never going to win. Like, I think I've matched one number in four years. <laughs> like, one number. I'm horrible. Don't ever go gambling with me unless you want to win and laugh at me. Okay. So, I think we've kind of come to the end of our time. Um, I'm going to have to pack up to get out of the way for our next speaker, but I do hope that you all um, will take time to connect and um, reach out to me if I can help. Please don't be the 99% of people who never take me up on that offer. Network, I will help you. If I can't, I will try and find somebody who can. Um, I'm going to unpack, but I will be available off to the side to talk or outside or tonight in the social. If you've got any questions, any feedback, positive, negative, this is a new presentation, so I am still working and tweaking it. Please let me know, and thank you so much for taking a chance to come out.